wanted to welcome everyone to uh, Apopsis Systems monthly Zoom session. I have a great speaker this morning in, in Jim, KI6ZUM. All of you probably know him as the, the Zoom master. <laughs> we all have uh, a Zoom spot, it seems. Uh, I know I have a couple, and I use them for all kinds of things. Uh, DMR, DSTAR, P25. It's very, very handy, and uh, that's kind of the, some of the stuff we're going to learn about today. Yeah, uh, the Papa system has been uh, doing fantastically. You know, uh, 2020 was a fantastic year. Anyway, so we have uh, great prospects for the coming year. And we're doing very, very well as a system. Uh, we've been taking care of a lot of business. And uh, I think in the coming months or so, everyone uh, will be receiving some uh, information about what's happening with the system and all that kind of stuff. So. But I'll refer to to our uh, to our chief cook and bottle washer here, uh, Mr. Casillas, WD uh, six F said A. Now, do you have any uh, any words of wisdom for us today? Well, first of all, I want to thank all of the membership that's been very supportive over the many, many, many years. But I, I want to comment on Jim, our our guest speaker today. Uh, Jim has been a longtime Papa member, and I still recall him wandering into a, a luncheon and say, hey, Cease, I've got an idea where we can build a, a D-Star repeater. And at that time, we were paying about four grand for a repeater, and he had a little printed circuit board and I looked at it, and of course, I don't know shit from Shinola when it comes to electronics, but he says we could uh, we could probably build it for under 400 bucks. And lo and behold, uh, we put Papa 9 up, and it just played and played and played. And I think we built it for 400 bucks. And uh, we just recently, with one of Jim's M... Uh, MMDVM uh, boards uh, put a, uh, a a new repeater up on the hill, but it played flaw flawlessly for uh, <clears throat> I don't know what do you think, Jim? About fourteen years, something like that. Sorry, I had to unmute here. Um, I think we put it up on Super Sunday in two thousand and eleven. So that makes it only 10 years old. Yeah, I remember you and I going over to Art's house and uh, sticking that in the in the back there and got it. I just couldn't believe it was doing it, you know. <laughs> that was yeah. such a fun project. I think we were the first kids on the block, Jim, with a, a non-ICOM D-Star repeater. And that's really, Jim, that's what amateur radio is all about, staying on the leading edge and I got to believe the Papa membership has certainly have, has helped us uh, keep the Papa system on the leading edge uh, with all the latest bells and whistles and uh, got to keep the members awake and, and guessing what's, what's on the horizon. Uh, anyway, uh, that's all I got uh, for you guys today. Uh, let me give it back to uh, Dave and get the show on the road. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cecil. And uh, what we're gonna do is we'll, uh, we'll close the door prize stuff uh, a little bit later, uh, maybe, maybe a half hour or so, maybe if there's a break in the middle of the, of the presentation, we'll, we'll do some of the drawings. So uh, Jim, without further ado, I, I'd like to introduce you, you know, um, KI6ZUM has uh, his Zoom spots uh, mainly, I, th I think, or only at uh, Ham Radio Outlet, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, uh, they're, they're great devices, and I use them for all three of the digital modes, DSR, DMR, and uh, P25. I have three of them, so that's how I do it. I know that the technology now is you can probably do all three modes with, with one device, but I just prefer having it simple, so I just switch from one radio to the other, and off I run. So there you go. Uh, uh, Jim, and uh, what I would like you to do is when you share your screen, just do side, hit the side by side button so that we can 
see you and your and your presentation at the same time. Okay, and I'm going to mute everyone. So what I would like you to do is, uh, Jim, is to unmute yourself. So I'm going to mute everyone now. I don't think you'll be muted, but I, I hope not. Uh, so if you are, go ahead and unmute, uh, Jim. Thank you so much. All right. So I wasn't sure what to cover in this presentation um, because most everyone has heard of or is using a hotspot of some form. So I decided to put in a bit more of the early history of hotspots and talk a bit more about the really early days as opposed to what's going on now. I mean, I'll certainly talk about what's going on now and I have little to share about new cool stuff because we never announce stuff before it's ready. But um, yeah, so let me dive in here, do some early history, talk about how open source has made a big deal, has it made a big difference in how all of this works. Uh, talk about the MMDVM project, which is crazy big now. Uh, talk about some hardware devices. We can't talk about hotspots without talking about things like Pystar, which is a software that helps make all of this user-friendly. Talk a bit about the modes that are available. Um, so hotspot basics, you guys probably know this. Most of the hotspots that you guys know about like at ZoomSpot are little devices, yay sized, 10 milliwatts. They become effective because they're internet connected to whatever it is you're trying to get to, a, a repeater, a talk group, and so on. They're generally incredibly inexpensive uh, most of the time it's done using your HT at low power. And at least in the world of MMDVM, we have good full support for DSTAR, DMR Fusion, NXT, and P25, and PoxSag. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of cross modes, and we'll talk a bit more about that. I think this is the sim most simple drawing of what a um, a hotspot looks like in the world of an amateur radio. Uh, can I specific. can I interrupt you just for a, yeah. a second uh, there, Jim? I would ask everyone not to use the chat at this time. Please do not use chat; it's distracting to everyone while the presentation is going on. We will give you a chance to ask questions via chat later, but uh, it really is disturbing to the middle of the presentation it, because it comes up on the screen and everybody sees it and it's something that we need to not do, okay? So save it for later. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, no problem, Dave. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I can, I'll find a nice spot halfway and we can make it a, a question, have to take some questions and do the drawing if, that, if that's helpful. Um, but essentially this is where your world is right now to simplify things. You've got your radios going into your repeater. Everybody's been doing that forever. The hotspot, you're using your, your, your whatever mode you want, DSTAR, DMR, Fusion, et cetera, into your hotspot, the hotspot into the internet, and then that gets connected to your reflectors um, and so on. This is a picture from Toshin's documentation. Toshin does a, an amazing job with all of the documentation. Um, it's not surprising when you see this, that his day job used to be writing technical documentation. This is the kind of world we have for DMR and how you can connect into DMR to a various talk group through Brandmeister, et cetera. You can see that there's a DSTAR HT into a hotspot and you, there's a Yesu Fusion hot, uh, radio into a hotspot. You got a DMR hot, a radio into a hotspot. Um, with all of these other things that have been built up and pretty much everything that you look at in this screen, the reflectors, the, the servers and so on, the bridges, almost everything of that is open source. And it's made this an incredible world that you've got people from every corner of the planet contributing to the various pieces and how they're working together. Um, we're very lucky. So 
this is my interpretation of, of hotspots and, and the early history. And I think it really goes back to the work that Jarl did in the early 90s with their development of D-Star. And the three key people I think of in those early days of you know, mid, to, mid to late 90s would be Mo Wheatley, Robin Kutcha, and Satoshi Yoshida. Um, In August of 2005, Jarl released the English translation of the D-Star specific, technical specification. Um, except for the AMBE stuff, everything you need to do a D-Star radio or a hotspot or a repeater is in that document. And um, yeah, I've spent a lot of time with that document over the years and so have a lot of other people. Um, and that English translation really started things off, getting things going. Um, Satoshi also was on the development team for DSTAR, so he has some really good knowledge. There's a post of his back in 2007 when he was talking about doing some experiments with the ADF-7021 chip, which is oddly enough the same chip that's in all the hotspots, including zoom spots and how he did some initial experiments and felt it was likely that you could do hotspotting as far back as 2007. Um, he was proposing a, a PIC controller, but you're not dedicated, not, you're not restricted to a, a PIC controller. And um, he, he did some amazing work back in then. Um, this is the board that Satoshi is more uh, famous for, which is the, which what he called the DB node adapter. Um, and you can see a basic little picture there where you use the adapter to USB back to your PC, to the internet, and on the other side through the, what we were using at the time was which, what we called 9600 capable radios. Um, and um, the board that Cecil was talking about was a derivative of this board here that um, was based on a PIC. Um, it was a kit that I put together and, and, and gave to the club to use. And it takes care of the GMSK uh, modulation and demodulation. Uh, pretty much everybody had to do it with this one chip from um, CML. And um, so for many years, this is how we all did hotspots. Um, I've I ran one at home for a long time with my uh, Yaesun 7900. And um, this is pretty much exactly what we were running up on the hilltop at, at, uh, up in Vista. Um, open source, even, even in the earliest days, Satoshi made available, and though he marked it as do not copy, he did make available cop copies of his schematics for his is homebrewed, and again, he calls it a homebrew DV, DV adapter. And um, this is really the basis for all of these hotspots, especially this design here. Also in 2007, we've got our good buddy, Mo Wheatley, who did some tremendous amount of work. And he also is using the same 7021 chip here. And this is a hotspot that includes the AMB chip and a microphone input that you could do D-Star. Uh, he made all the firmware and all the schematics for this board open source. Now, because of a few initial design mistakes, probably because he just didn't know, this board didn't work very well and he kind of abandoned it. And But it's standing on the shoulders of giants for the rest of us on all these projects that we were doing. Hold on, one too many. And then next step for Mo was the DVAP. And I'm sure a lot of you know about them and probably a lot of you may even have them sitting in a drawer like I do. Um, it was a great piece of hardware that he developed and in conjunction with Robin's software on the PC side, it was a great way for people to get their HT into the internet. It worked very well. There, again, there were some design decisions that were made that made it difficult to expand. And again, we stood on the shoulders of giants. 
So for me, and you may notice that this picture on the bottom right looks a lot like the invite. Um, I started doing a bunch of experiments with D-Star uh, way back in 2010. I did my own little version of the DD dongle that uh, Robin and Mo did. Um, but I started looking at the DV node adapters and the GMSK modulation and thought that there would be a better processor that we could use than the one that everybody had been using. Started in some experiments and it seemed like it was going to work. Um, and around the same time, um, some of you may know the name Boos van Doren, who's uh, also the creator of the DV Mega. Um, the picture on the right is essentially the hardware and software that he and I co-developed to do D-Star, which eventually became the DV Mega port. Um, originally, it was intended to be all open source. At some point, he decided to make a business of it and decided to um, close source all of his work and move forward. I took the opposite path, which was to take all the open source and continue to make it open sourced. And it still remains open source. Um, that little PCB on the top of the PCB, which is on top of the Pi, is an evaluation board from um, analog devices for the 7021 chip. Um, see, so you can nod, but I think you still say you've got one that still works somewhere at your place, probably serial number one of the ones that we did. Um, it was a great little project. Um, I, I will do a side note is there was a software bug that crashed the board once every two days. And um, it was one of the toughest software bugs for me to find in my entire career. It took me nearly six months to find it, um, mostly because I just took at least two days every time you wanted it to crash. I talk about it with uh, new hires and uh, and new and uh, new employees that I'm mentoring about difficult engineering problems and how to go about solving them. Um, MMDVM, multi-mode digital voice modem. Jonathan and I had conversations about various things over the years, and um, he had a group on Yahoo supporting some of his early works. And there's a quote there from the spring of 2015, where he had done some analysis of based on his um, career in doing DS, uh, audio DSP work. And he thought we could make a multi-mode repeater. And um, we had a conversation um, by email. And um, I looked at what he was doing thought about it and said, you know, I'm not really interested in participating. I don't think we can make this work. And, um, but said, thank you. And then I slept on it for a couple of days and thought about it some more and went, you know, Jonathan really knows this stuff here. He's got to have something to it. So I um, spent some time looking at the hardware side and I'll show you that in, in another, in another slide in a minute. Um, about what I came up with to help him. He has written unbelievable amounts of software for MMDVM, just absolutely crazy amounts. And all of his code is open source. It's all GPL2. It's been used and reused over and over again. It's just unbelievable what he's done. And I also have to give a shout out to Andy um, in Chile, CD6JAU. He has done unbelievable amounts of work in the firmware and also in the MMDVM software itself to make this project possible. Um, he was able to take my DSTAR code for the firmware and Jonathan's DMR and Fusion code from MMDVM and over a long weekend came back with firmware so that we had three modes supported. It was tremendous how much he did and how quickly. So in the summer of 2015, while I was discussing with Jonathan, I decided to take one of my experiment boards that I had done a couple of years before, make some hardware mods, change around some things, um, 
sent it to Jonathan. And so this basically is a, a board that plugs into our Arduino um, DUA board, uh, then connects by USB to your computer. And this then connects to your radio. So you basically have transmit audio, receive audio, ground, and PTT. And so I did the initial firmware for the Arduino and I sent it to Jonathan along with the board. And about three days later, he sent me a pointer to a zip file. I brought it down on my side. I got it all compiled up. And we had the first two D-Star repeaters from MDVM up and running. Um, a lot's changed since this initial board. Um, we did a lot more testing. He did a lot more work. And um, we kind of did a first introduction of this project at Pacificon during my talk there. I brought a few extra boards with me. It's, it seemed to get a lot more attention than I, any of us have expected. We had someone who got a board from me on the Saturday at Pacificon. He stayed up all night in his hotel room and built his own repeater. He was that excited. And I, at that point, we knew this was really something. Um, so you can see in the bottom left, it's a slightly later, gener later generation of the MMDV board, also plugged into a DUA, then to USB to a Pi. The Pi has been a great platform for us based on its cost and the ease of getting the software on it. Um, you can see in the middle picture in the bottom there, that's the MMDV and Pi. That's the board that um, you really use if you're going to build a repeater. Um, I know Papa's got a bunch of them that we've been happy to pass on. Those have a very high-end uh, ARM processor on there. I think it runs upwards of 200 megahertz. Um, it's got a lot of room for other things. Um, in fact, Jonathan, in his spare time, has added M17 and AX25 support now, and now also supports um, even just an analog repeater. And then as an alternative for people is the MMDVM for Nucleo. And you'll see in a later slide, it's, it's being used more often for um, people building TNCs uh, because there's another project that has been using them. Um, and you can see the amount of electronic circuitry now that's had through the uh, morphing over the years to try and get the best analog design that we can get to really squeeze out the last bit of performance out of your radios. Um, MMDVM board then proceeded. I really should have had another picture. And maybe during the break, I'll unshare and find a pic, another picture. I've got it here somewhere, the first um, zoom spot prototype. Um, but we decided fairly early on that the processor that we were using didn't really have enough memory, didn't have enough horsepower. And, um, and so I made the decision early on to switch from the Atmel world to ST's ARM processors, picked a pretty good sized part. And uh, that's been a good choice because we can now fit all of those modes in that chip. And um, there's still a little bit of room left for expansion. Um, the Pi version of the board the, the ZoomSpot RPI was designed to plug into just about any Pi. And um, early on, there were no displays on them. And thanks to some community efforts, someone wrote the device driver so that we could have the OLED, the screen on the, the, that's on the left there. Uh, someone else went and started doing the work on doing the um, code to support the, the intelligence screens from Nextion and other vendors. I decided a while ago to do some nice new overlays so that they look nice and, uh, and so on. And those are well supported. Um, some of you might recognize the call sign that just happened to be going over the one on the right when I was taking pictures. Um, there's also the ZoomSpot USB, which is something that a lot of people have been using. And um, that makes it more portable if you've got a laptop or um, I use it on a tablet. Um, but essentially, it's the same circuitry as the regular Pi version, just in a much more compact form. Um, I'll, I'll whip through these very quickly. Um, a number of you also use the duplex version of the ZoomSpot. Um, it's a feature that really does 
give you the thing that most people have been asking for when they're using DMR, which is how do I get off of um, talk group 91 when no one can get a word in edgewise worldwide? At least duplex gets you two, two time slots and gets you to um, get your chance to, to move over or, or you can be monitoring two at the same time. And we did a design for the duplex board at the same time as we did the design for the original Zoom spot in 2016, but no one was interested at the time. And so it sat in a drawer. Um, eventually people started asking for it. I pulled it out of the drawer, got it back working again, reduced it down to a zero size PCB. And it's been popular with some people. And we also did a dual band board, um, but Quite honestly, the number of people asking for VHF has been relatively small, so it's not been as popular a board. Um, Pi-Star. Um, I, I, I was going to see if I could do a, a share here of Pi-Star running um, so I can show some things. Let me see if this is going to work. OK. so. Um, Here's dashboard for PyStar. Um, it's the latest version. I've got it running on a regular Pi. Um, I've got it set up on worldwide right now. And um, if you want to just be able to listen, worldwide is always a great one because there's somebody talking almost all the time. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to the modes enabled stuff here and the network status on the top left. Uh, hopefully, everybody can read that. PyStar has been able to um, put together all of the pieces of the MMDVM project. Um, MMDVM host is the main software that does the heavy lifting. But when you get into these other modes, Andy in Chile has written all of these cross mode tools. So you're able to do things like fusion to DMR, fusion to NXDN. DMR to NXDN, DMR to Fusion, Fusion to P25. And so when someone asks me, what do I recommend they buy if they really want to get into digital mode and just play around inexpensively? And I've been, a long time I've been a fan of DSTAR. And so if you were able to get like a 31, that's a great radio to start with. Um, the other is a, um, an FT70, because it's digital mode. You can go into all the fusion repeater, uh, fusion repeaters and so on. But using cross mode, then you get into D NXDN and the DMR and the P25 networks. So you basically get four networks for the price of one radio. So I've been a proponent, and it's possibly the simplest radio of all the ones I have to get it up and running and getting you on the air in the first place. Um, when you're doing configuration of Pi Star, the first time user, it's pretty simple for them. And most of you are probably very familiar with this, but essentially it's enter your call sign, enter your DMR ID, put your frequency in, select your modem that you want to use and save those changes, turn on the mode you want. In this case, I've got DMR set up. And you just set up your DMR configuration. You do need to remember now that there's now hotspot security for DMR. You've got to make sure you have your brand Meister password applied. And you are up and running on all of these networks. Um, I think it's more difficult to figure out how to program your radio than it is to do PyStar. Um, so Dave, I'm just wondering, let me just go back to the presentation here. Um, I was going to talk a bit more about the networks and so on. I don't know. I see a hand, and I wonder if there's questions. Did you want to take a a, 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 a raffle break and a question break? Okay, we could do that. So just unshare your screen. Uh, sharing. I am no longer sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Jim. This is this is awesome. I'm learning some things. Uh, Rex, do you want to uh, do a couple of drawings and then we'll take some questions? I need a couple minutes to cut up tickets here, so maybe take some okay. questions. Right. That's great. Be ready. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Bruno had a question. Bruno, go ahead. 
Okay, uh, sorry, I, I posted it there. Are there any plans to offer a version of the uh, voc uh, uh, the Zoom Spot that has two vocoders, like what Open Spot 3 does essentially, so it could cross mode between D star and the others? Um, I would love to. Um, the difficult part is in order to do the cross mode, you need a version of the DVSI chip and the bulk pricing for that chip is $79. And so the bill of materials goes up by that amount. Um, there are some things going on in the background that we're trying to come up with a solution that doesn't cost $79, but DVSI holds the, um, the all the all the face cards in this in this game. Um, what I can say is that um, I was given a patent analysis to look at, and its conclusion, while it's not a um, an opinion letter from a patent attorney, the analyst felt that the D-Star patents, the last possible one, would have expired in November of 2019. So there's some things that can be done if someone really had the skills to help with the, the um, AMBE codex for D-Star that would get us towards what you're asking for. Um, but my biggest problem is the cost. You know, $80 one chip for eighty dollars makes it a much more expensive product. Is this how OpenSpot or uh, the uh, Shark? That's how they're doing it. They're putting two chips, so but they're passing on the price to the user. That's why it costs so much. Uh, the, if this wasn't a recorded thing and this was in a bar over beer, I could talk about how they're doing it. But I don't. Miss, I don't want to say anything. But okay, I'm not sure everything is on the up and up. I have heard from people who don't believe that. Everything is on the up and up from then. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, we have any other? Uh, I had a question from... for you. What, what is your background, your education? Um, good question. I had my degree in electrical engineering. And so I've spent almost my entire career in um, doing electronics design. Mostly, mostly in the world of high-speed um, digital and um, FPGA-type designs. But D-Star is what really got me interested in amateur radio again. So uh, I see a hand up from Ron. I have a quick question, Jim. Yeah, go ahead. W6CJX. I have this. Does this look like anything that you might have worked on? Looks like an early. <laughs> it's it, probably getting messed up with the background, but uh, yes, I think it this looks. Is, it looks an awful lot like the one that was in the invite. The really early model. I still have it. Yeah, I'm saving it for the Smithsonian. So yeah. we'll, we'll get it submitted soon for you. Thank yeah, you it, so much, Jim, for everything you do. Yeah, you're you're welcome. Um, it, it, it's a it's a neat little thing that I'm here. I still hear from people with the earliest <laughs> versions of these the lid on top. Yeah, I get the lid for it too. The the yeah. cases were really really hard to find, but I think we won this at a pop up picnic. Uh, my lovely wife, KK Six OMC. I know it's hard to see because of the darn background, but you got you know what it is. So I just wanted to show that to you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, very cool. I have a question also. Yeah. So you, uh, in, in the Pi Star, you uh, said enter in your DMR number. And it's my understanding, at least that's the way I have it set up that I read, uh, that for each uh, hotspot you have, like I have three DMR hotspots, it's my call sign and then zero one and call sign zero two, call sign zero three. It's supposed to have a, a zero one or or a zero two or a zero three behind it. I guess that designates for them that it's a hotspot. Is is that correct? Um, there is so much of this project of MMDVM and all the other servers and stuff that I don't understand. I just don't have time. 
but but I, my understanding is you are correct that if you have more than one, you need to designate them with a with a separate number. Otherwise, you end up with problems like the D star world has, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, where you they really don't like it when you have more than one hotspot connecting into the same talk group at the same time, without a way to differentiate between them. Yeah, that's the ESSID. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. I I typically don't run more than one hotspot on at a time on a single mode. So this particular setup had no uh, ID in it set. So it's treated as a default. My other question is how, how big or small is the software that's in one of these with all the software and everything that you guys have done? Um, you mean the PyStar or the firmware that's on the board itself? Um, maybe both. Okay. So the software that runs on, let me try to pick one up here. So the software that runs on something like um, the, the USB device is sitting on an old, uh, is sitting on a, an ST micro part. Um, we've got all the firmware completely all modes packed into less than 64k there's an incredible amount of code that's been written and it's pretty op optimized and pretty low level written code there's very few high level libraries used on the pi um, the whole image for um, pi star uncompresses if it's on a two gig sd card and that's all of all of the Linux environment and all the software. Um, it's kind of big because the, the actual MMDVM host software is kind of big because it's got a lot of stuff in there to support all of the different display types like the OLED and the Nexteon and there's four or five other ones that it supports. There's all kinds of different modems that you support. If you go into PyStar now and you click on the, the list of modems, there's 30 different modems in there, um, all different vendors and, and people working in their garages coming up with stuff. So I don't remember the exact size of the, the executable. It's in the few hundred K, I think, is what the main MMDVM is in its compiled form. Question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What if you overclock your Pi? Does it uh, cause an effect, a detrimental effect to the board itself, the daughter board? No, the, my pie. no um, the main pie board talks to the, the hat on top over the UART. So as long as your pie is still talking at a nice accurate UART speed, then there should be no issues. Um, the only thing I could think of is if you were using like a 3B plus or a four, then get pretty hot. Um, and yes, yeah, so I don't have don't a four have that, that I'm source. overclocking. Yeah, yeah so I've got a cooling to, tower on it, so yeah, then yeah. you should be fine. And you, you don't really want the, the, the oven of of heat coming up from the the processor on the four directly underneath, the the temperature controlled oscillator that's trying to keep your frequency on on right on on right on the dot to keep you from having to do any adjustments. So you're clocking against on the UR channel, then that's how you're clocking off the the pi, yeah. then. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, and then the the the. Um, um, the board itself, hold on, I'm trying to the wrong one, but the board itself has its, its own TCXO on it. So that all of the clocking relative to the RF side to keep it on frequency is all done based on this horrendously expensive oscillator that's on the board. But as far as Thank the speed between, between the Pi and the board is all done on UART. So there should be no, shouldn't matter. You could over under overclock, underclock, it shouldn't make any difference. Um, I do see one more hand up from Michael, Whiskey 7 Michael Lima. Yes, I apologize if I missed this at the beginning. Um, when I first heard about D-Star on PAPA, uh, I was told it was proprietary uh, technology for ICOM, and I just wasn't interested in uh, getting involved with that. And then years later, I was told that the DMR came out and it wasn't proprietary, so I got involved with digital. How did you get around all those uh, patents and uh, trade secrets back in those days? So for DSTAR, 
by um, why don't why don't I share again here so I can get back and uh, uh, and I'll answer your question by going back to the top of the presentation here. Um, hold on. Here, this was part of my presentation. Is that in two thousand five? Uh, Jaw released the DSTAR specification as an English translation. And so that gave all of the technical details of what was needed for DSTAR with the exception of the audio compression stuff from DVSI. And when you're doing a hotspot or a repeater, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is that the radio does the audio compression. And by compression, I mean like zip or zip compression not as, as bandwidth compression um and so the radio does the compression it passes that compressed audio entirely across the network through repeaters throughout the internet and everything goes to the other end and gets transmitted out and then the radio at the other end does the decompression so you don't need to deal with any of the patents you don't have to deal with any of the proprietary technologies if you're doing a repeater or a hotspot you just use the specification as dis defined by Jarl. And not everything I needed was in that spec, and there was a lot of reverse engineering that went with it. But it meant that unless you were doing your own thing, like uh, Robin and Mo did with the DV dongle, you didn't need to worry about those patents. And um, it's similarly done for DMR and some of the other networks that a lot of these things are well documented or they've been reverse engineered. And um, a lot of work and a lot of information sharing has gone on over the years to make this possible. Does that uh, mostly answer what you're looking for? It does. Thank you very much. All right. Um, let's see. So I was going to just talk a little bit more about how big all of this has gotten. And I was looking the other day, and the best information I can find is that that the DMR ID that most every one of you are using for your DMR world, they've now registered just over, within the very last little while, 200,000 call signs. Uh, the DSTAR database, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's still north of 50,000. NXDN, 4,000 call signs. There's a, that's a lot of people using these open source or open environment networks. Um, I mean, it's just amazing. Here's a snapshot from the Brandmeister dashboard um, from a few days ago. If you look at that, nearly four, uh, nearly 13 and a half thousand hotspots were online and active at that time worldwide. And that's just crazy numbers. I just, and 4,600 repeaters. It, it's just difficult to imagine numbers being this big. And a huge percentage of those are running Jonathan's MMDVM based software. And, and associated boards and, and, and so on using MMDVM based firmware for the hotspots. It's just, uh, it just blows my mind that when I did this project early on with Jonathan and the others, there was none of us could possibly imagine it would get this big. So last night I figured I'd say, okay, well, how many hotspots are there in the DSTAR world? And I went to one Charlie and I looked at it and okay, well, when Charlie's got a lot of gateways connected to it. And then you're looking here and you see a lot of call signs and hotspots listening. And I started scrolling down and I started scrolling down and then I kept scrolling and scrolling. That's how many hotspots alone were connected to one Charlie last night. Um, it just, it, it blows my mind. And this is partly why um, the guys who run one uh, reflector one really prefer that you don't just hang out there and stay all day long because each one of those is a stream and they really prefer that you not connect more than one hotspot at the same time and that all of this is bandwidth and, but it's just amazing how many people are using it um so one of the things i alluded to earlier was um can we do other things beyond MMDVM, but within the same hardware. And so there's a, an associated pro project from MobileLink um, for an open source TNC. And so it runs on that um, 
ST micro eval board. That's on that little white thin board on the right hand side. And uh, well, I did quickly an adapter board to go between it and my MMBV infranucleo board. And this becomes one of the greatest TNC, KISS TNCs that you can get. The firmware that they've done as part of that open source project is tremendous. It's really been doing a lot of good work in DSPs and you're leveraging that against all of the knowledge and all the work that's been done for those analog filters and amplification and so on that's been done supporting all of the MMDVM repeaters. And uh, so anybody who wants to can take one of these relatively inexpensive nucleo boards and order some boards from Osh Park because those are files are available up there and get a ST micro board and you've got yourself a, a really outstanding quality KISS TNC. Um, a good friend of mine is running one of these for his APRSI gate and he's been running it for ages and he finds it works great. Um, and then there's side projects coming along from MMDVM and so on. You've got uh, Sean Chain over there in China. Didn't like how difficult it was for him to get the IP address of his Raspberry Pi when he was booting it up. So he just made the code changes to put a QR code so that you can QR that with your phone. Um, Roger Clark, who's um, a, a rock star in this world of MMDVM and other things. He's also responsible for most of the libraries that make the ST micro chips usable for so many people. Um, they opened up the firmware for the, um, the radio oddity GD77 radio, completely rewrote it, moved the MMDVM firmware into it, and so you can plug your radio, your GD77 radio by USB into your computer, and it acts like a five watt hotspot. And so every year on Amazon day, they seem to sell the GD77 for $60. And so it's, it's difficult to get a, as easy to use five watt MMDVM hotspot as the, as the, as this radio. And they just have it plugged into a $10 Raspberry Pi. The aspect ratio is a little messed up, but you can see there in the very bottom right hand corner. Um, community support. This software is all open source. It's all up for anyone to use, to modify, to change, to fix up on GitHub. G4KLX is Jonathan's code. Um, Andy is uh, in that Hurry Baparada um, page. His, his is the firmware that's used by lots of people. Um, there used to be very active Yahoo support groups until Yahoo turned them all off. And unfortunately, that's all lost. Um, but Jonathan has transitioned over to groups.io, and he's still helpful there. And there's still plenty of people there who are able to help answer questions. And I still, and I'm going to point out again, Toshin's documentation. It's it's by far to me the, the easiest to follow of all the documentation versions that I use. And. Thank you, Cecil, for being my straight man on component shortages. Um, everybody's heard about the shortages. Everybody's heard about the fire in the factory in Japan and so on. Every industry that uses electronics is affected. Um, you, you see the stories about car manufacturers turning off production lines because they can't buy boards, can't buy chips. It's not just semiconductors now, it's expanding beyond that. Um, you know, you've got amateur radio. I heard yesterday that Kenwood is down to like one radio that they can still make and then they're working on new ones. Um, ICOM's new 52, ID52 is coming out. It's not to be seen anytime soon. Uh, soon. Um, so what did companies start doing earlier this year? They started stockpiling and they stockpiled. And it was a lot like the lines at Costco for toilet paper. They were buying up parts and I do the same thing for all of my manufacturing and I don't like it and it's a huge cost. 
And so as an example, if I want to buy one of the processors that I use on these boards, you know, typically they would be in the two or $3 range under normal times. The only vendor that I can find that actually still has them last time I checked wanted $14 for them. So prices are going up and it's concerning. So all that being said, um, last month's Papa luncheon donation, I had intended to be able to deliver that right away and I can't. Um, there's one listed for today for a, a Nexteon 3.5 kit. I'd really like to be able to deliver that soon. Um, I'm hoping it'll be soon. My factory is telling me that there are ship boards by the end of the week, but I'm not holding my breath. It's, it's difficult for everybody. And uh, we're trying very hard to keep everything in stock, but I can't. And I'm just, we're just hoping everybody can be patient till this gets better. My ears are saying it'll be 2023 before we see some normalcy to the semiconductor world, which is, um, unfortunate and um, but we're doing our best to try to keep things going and um, and so lastly people ask about what are you doing that's new and we have boards that we've been working on if they don't work well enough I don't want to release them um, I will say that we had a board designed that was going to be a um, basically like a zoom spot but using a new radio that Delta in, in IQ instead of just um, picking a, a built-in mode would have it would have allowed you to do just about anything you could possibly imagine in those 25 kilohertz um, chips not available anymore. So, and it was incredibly difficult to use. So we had to abandon it. I really was hoping we could make it work because that was going to be a pretty cool project. And that would have meant all kinds of new things all kinds of new modes that you could add in there just and uh, it's not going to be happening anytime soon um so i am at the end of my slides if there are more questions i'm happy to take them i can hang around a little afterwards if people want to just chat afterwards um, rex i think you've got some more um things to give away and i don't know if you've got any other uh, people on the agenda to talk even briefly or anything else that needs to get covered, but I will uh, stop my share and it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, that was awesome. It's unfortunate that we have such shortages in the semiconductor world. It's really hampering a lot of things. I'm looking forward to that ICOM 52. I was uh, hoping <laughs> it was gonna be delivered this summer, but I have a feeling that uh, we're going to have to wait. So, do you have any idea on some of these uh, commercial products, like like the Icon Fifty Two, when they're going to release that? They haven't said anything, and and I doubt they'd ever tell me. Um, I hear stuff, and the bottom line is, the chips that they use, some of them just aren't available. And that factory in Japan really messed things up because not only did they make the audio codecs, which are used in these radios, they're also used in high-end audio equipment, AVRs and other things like that. They also made the dyes for temperature controlled crystal oscillators. I use one or more on every one of my boards and while mine weren't manufactured in that factory, it meant that supply vanished from the factories I normally would use. That makes it difficult. So everybody's scrambling to try and do things. I will say that if I was a manufacturer and I had a line of amateur equipment and I had a line of commercial equipment and some of the chips that I use on both sets of equipment became scarce, I would probably focus my attention on the commercial market because I can charge often can charge a lot more for the commercial equipment. And so who do, who do you make an HT for? Do you make it for a first responder or do you make it for an amateur? That, and so I'm hoping that they're going to have new stuff with new chips, but even the other vendors who make these audio codecs or similar parts don't have a lot capability because there's just no available space on the fabs. 
Well, it, it, it speaks to a greater problem. And this has been going on for many years, actually a couple of decades, outsourcing manufacturing uh, out of the United States. So we've kind of lost control of, of the service line for say tanks, like ball bearing manufacturing is no longer done in this country, as I understand it. There's a lot of uh, machinists uh, that have been transferred to Asia, a lot of machining companies are not, not working anymore in the United States. So it really, <laughs> it really uh, points to a, a huge problem. Yeah. Uh, if, if we're dependent on one factory in a foreign country to supply us absolutely essential electronic gear, that, that's, not, that's not good. And Bruno uh, made that, that comment in Slack. This is AB6MB with a question. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeff. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering that if uh, Robin brought out that D-Star uh, dongle, oh, God, how many years ago was it? Uh, Jim, uh, you think that triggered the whole hotspot craze? Because I remember that thing had an impact. Everybody started buying it. And the repeater owners were a little complaining a little bit that everybody's using those instead of the repeaters. But uh, what, uh, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. So Robert and Mo brought out first the DV dongle, the blue device, and then brought out the DVAP, which is the red device, which had RF. The blue device was disruptive. And I think it was a, in a good way, it was disruptive because it wasn't just Robin's software that was getting used for it. Jonathan that was part of Jonathan's early development was to make use of Robin's dongle to get the access to the AMBE encoding and decoding. So yes, it had an impact um, there, but it was different than the hotspots because the, dis the hotspots didn't need to have the blue dongle to, to function because that capability was in the radios. But you're right, every, every significant disruption in amateur radio, whether it be sideband or blue dv dongles is going to disrupt and ruin the ruin the uh the, the hobby so but yes i think it had a big i think it had a big effect and it had an effect on me because it gave me pieces that i could experiment with without having to build a new pcb to get the chip and so on so hey thank you very much um, you said you don't like talking about the future, but uh, what any plans, um, uh, ideas of, you know, in the next year or two or three, uh, how this could evolve and, and what's next in, in Zoom spots and whatnot? Yeah, so I don't know what the future is going to bring. I think that um, much of MMDVM development depends on uh, Jonathan's spare time mm -hmm. and, and when there he's because uh, some of his he works contract based so sometimes he'll be on a contract that is away from home Monday night Tuesday Wednesday Thursday night and then back home for the others every week so when he's sitting in a flat somewhere with nothing else to do then he becomes very productive with adding features so he has talked about things that he wants to add in as software features uh, things like uh, uh, DPMR or some other things. Um, he's already done so much good work of adding um, M17 and, uh, and so on. As far as the hardware goes, um, I would love to have a cost-effective solution that lets us do cross-mode with everything. And that, that's a problem that we need to figure out. Um, I did mention, I mentioned earlier about the patent analyst, analyst that gave me some information. He'd also looked at the last patents that are needed to do P25, NXDN, and, uh, and DMR, and, and, and Fusion as well. And he thinks it could be as late as 2028 for those to expire. So we have some significant amount of time between now and then. Um, I think some tremendous things could happen if... Um, um, those patents expire and we get to use all of those modes freely um, later in the decade. Um, 
one thing I didn't talk about was some software that's quite popular lately in the form of things like uh, uh, Dude Star and Droid Star. Uh, a lot of people are starting to use them. I am not convinced that using code that appears to have been stolen from the MD380 radio is a really great way to move forward with a project for everybody to use. So codec support in the future is absolutely something I would like to do. And being able to support modes that we don't support now, I absolutely want to do. And in the future, if we could have some hardware that lets us do some modulation schemes that we can't do now in the 7021 chip and open it up to all kinds of stuff, that would be, that's my goal, but I don't have a good, I don't have a chip I can use right now to do that. So I don't know, hopefully that answers your question. So I see a question here from Ken, do I only have to buy one per 10 years? No, the question was, you know, the cost of something manufactured overseas versus something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, yeah so, so here, and so obviously people will, you know, vote with their pocketbook. So that's what's driven the overseas uh, manufacturing, but, you know, it comes with a price, and that price is that we're vulnerable. Yeah. Well, and I don't, you know, and when yeah, it comes to our military and some other, you know, very important technologies, I think uh, we need to have our own, our own uh, manufacturing base. Yeah, that's my yeah. opinion. Anyway, it's for whatever that's worth. Yeah. And I, I don't want to dwell on the foreign versus domestic manufacturing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really expensive to build a new line for semiconductors. You're in the billions of dollars to you have to really have a lot of money and capital and ready to go and that sort of thing. Um, and we, I haven't heard anything in the last week or two, but um, it, it may get much worse than it is now because of the drought in Taiwan. And there were some stories saying that they're going to cut off the water supplies to the factories that are making all the chips in Taiwan and turn those all off. And that's where, that's TSMC, so that's, like that's pretty much everybody who's doing their own silicon, like every iPhone and everything else. We need, we need a, a huge investment in, in the US and new factories and it needs to be done soon. And you can't just call up Amazon and order a new factory. So I've said my piece. It, it's, 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 a, it's a huge part of my job every day is dealing with these shortages. Anyway, well, thank um, you very much, Jim. Uh, if there's no more questions, what we can do is adjourn and everyone can unmute and talk uh, as they wish. Uh, Jim, you said you would stick around. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I've got a few minutes. A bit. Yeah, so I'm going to stop the recording. And uh, Have, is I think you mentioned it. Unfortunately, I was doing two Zoom calls at the same time. I, I can multitask even as old as I am. So I may have missed. Um, this thing. Uh, I'm curious about the M17 thing. Is there any interest in that? I'm not advocating it. Actually, I go the other way. I wish it would go away because I think the last thing we need is yet another freaking standard. But but um, I'm just kind of curious uh, if there's any thought uh, toward that in MMDVM or whatever, mainly because mainly I'm, ho I'm hoping the answer is no. But so so M17 has been fully ported over to the MMDVM hardware. So you can do some levels of uh, M17. And um, in fact, Jonathan posted this past week saying that he, I think he said that it's code complete that you can do your own M M17 repeater now with all of the code that's available. Um, I'm not sure I'm good with the, um, the, I, the ideals of M17 saying we want to make sure we do we do do this and exclude all possibility of interworking with all the other existing modes. Um, there's the oh gosh I forget the number. There's there was also a the start down of doing an open source HT based on M17 and um, it never finished. It, it, it's development and it hasn't been touched in six months or more. 
I think it might have more gained more attention because it had pretty much everything you needed except for an AMBE chip to be able to do all of the other modes, DSTART, DMR, Fusion, P25, NXTN. And so in theory, I think they could have got the attention that was needed and the other people involved to help develop it if they'd gone the path of saying, you, we, we're not interested in participating. If it has anything to do with the existing modes, it has to be M17 only. So I, I think there's work being done on it, but it's not going quickly. I mean, Codec 2 has got its benefits and so on, um, but there's some commercial stuff that's out there that those patents are starting to get close to being expiring too. And that might also limit how effective or how useful Codec 2 is. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, I, I mean, my thinking goes along, okay, now, now instead of five standards, we have six standards. And when I say, okay, somebody's going to make an HT, are they going to make something as good as this APX? I don't think so. And the price of these things, while still high, is going to come down. So I, I don't know. I was just curious what the thinking is. Um, the, I yeah. mean, you know where I come from, you know, it's just yeah. a long time background in direct TV and Echo Star and all this stuff. And I, and I see, you know, five standards in that and it didn't help anybody. So I, I don't know. I was just yeah. kind of curious. Yeah. Well, you remember how many years ago CSI was trying to develop a hardware platform for an HT that could be multi-standard. Yeah. Yeah. The unicorn. And it's hard to make something commercial. I mean, we've looked at a lot of these radios, like, you know, with, with the, um, the GD77 project, you know, there's a lot that can be done that did DMR, but there's some, I, I don't know all the details, but I think there's some, there's enough in there that's going to make it, um, I, I mean, I lost my train of thought. So the, um, the, the radio has some things that prevent it from doing some of these other modes. And so, while the hardware's most of the hardware's there, if they had done some things a little differently, they might have been able to get. Um, they might have been somehow able to get a platform that people could use to create nice radios that do all the modes. Um, but it's not going to happen anytime soon, I don't think. And I I don't have the the engineering to go out and develop a new radio from scratch and do all the mechanicals and enclosures and. Yeah, there's so much to making a radio centered around making it nice, easy to use, making the code plug nice. Uh, yeah, so I, I get back to, okay, a lot of people have done this already. Why not use those? But, but anyway, thanks. Uh, that's that's kind of all I need to know. All right. So it kind of got off track. I don't know whether we fully answered Eddie's question or not. Was, did, did it get covered, Eddie? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it did. I kind of figured it was something in there because a lot of people I've talked to uh, before about, you know, the, the cross mode and everything got kind of confusing. I'm like, okay, well, if you don't see a cross mode switch on there for D star, then it's not possible on that software yet, right. you know. Yeah, so, so there's, yeah, you, you cleared that up. Yeah, so if you want to use a bunch of what I think is stolen software, we could probably make it work, but we're, philosophically, the project isn't going to go there. Yeah. Hey, hey yeah. Jim, this is Dave again. Oh, on, that particular, on that particular thing, how, how are the um, open spot guys doing it? Because uh, I understand they can do that. That's a great question, Dave, because when you look at pictures of the PCB that I have seen, they're using the 3000R chip, which can only do one channel at a time, and yet they're doing simultaneous coding, and that chip is not capable of that. And so I don't know how they would do that other than one might speculate that, they're, the, um, um, that the processor that they're using on the board is an ARM-based one, so in theory, one way to do it would be to take the MD380 code and just put it in your own processor so that you don't have to spend the $79, you can use the $18 chip. Hmm. Okay. The only option we have right now for doing this would be 
to put down a 3000 and R part and a 4000 beside it because the 4000 does D star only and you use the fourth, the 3000 based for all the other modes. And then we, we could in theory create a, a, the hardware that would do simultaneous transcoding, but it's expensive. It's both in board real estate and in bill of materials cost and software development time. Yeah, and how many would you sell? I don't know. The, the version of the um, uh, MMDVM HS board that was done with a 3000 um, F part, or which I'm not sure, I forget exactly which version it was. It came out with big fanfare, but I don't know whether they sold more than just a very, very small number of them. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Jim, uh, yeah. we've got a bit more of an operational than a technical question. The, um, I, I was blessed last year with winning one of your Zoom spots. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it greatly. I, the, the basic documentation that came with it allowed me to get it set up, and it's working just fine. But I go and look at the configuration, and I see a whole lot of different settings in there. I don't know what 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 happened what they are i can't i haven't yet found any documentation is there a more de detailed documentation package available have you figure out whether or not i can benefit from some of the other settings um i would take a look at toshin's documentation um if you go to the hro webpage for the zoom spot there should be a link to toshin's document there if it's not just, um, no, let me see. While, while I'm doing this, let me just, let me see if I can find the link. Well, I, I copied I, I copied the link down off of your chart where you made reference to it, so. Okay. Yeah, that was one of it. Here's what I'll just do is, I'll just send everyone. I'm just sending the link. This is Toshin's website. He's got a lot of documentation there. I would start with his stuff. It, it's just so good. He does okay, such great. a great job. I was, I was lucky enough to be emailing with him and helping deal with problems a couple of years ago, and um, turned out the family vacation was gonna. We were going to Colorado for the for the vacation, and it turned out I was driving about three miles past away from his door on the way to where we were staying. So I got to go and visit with him for a little while. We had a great conversation. He's a great guy. I wish I'd had more time to talk to him. Start with his document. I'll do this. Thank he, you. He's got a huge amount of stuff in there. He, he does this for fun. And, and it, it's helping a lot of people. So I don't know if, if, I don't know, Marvin, if you're still on, I can't see everybody here, but I keep forgetting to mention, I have your hotspot here. It's packed up and it's in, I intend to get it shipped out in the next couple of days. It got lost under some stuff and for a while and it's, I'll put back together and working and it should be on its way to you. No problem. So a question out of uh, ignorance, is Pi Star and your Zoom spot related or is that competition? Okay, so yeah, I probably should have talked more about this, but if you think of Pi Star, if you think of the Zoom spot being the hardware, the low level stuff, the stuff that does the RF, creating, putting the bits together, going over the RF that your radio recognizes. And then on top of that is Jonathan's MMDVM software, which takes care of how the repeaters, reflectors, hot, uh, talk groups, hotspots, everybody talk to one another. And then on top of that is PyStar, which is a, a user, relatively user-friendly user interface that allows you to do things like put your call sign in, change the, change the frequency, and so on. Um, and it kind of wraps around MMDVM software itself. If you want, and I still do this on some of my testing, is on a Linux box, I just build MMDVM host and run it from the command line. Um, but PyStar is really created as a, use, as a user interface that the common ham can use without too much difficulty. That's part of that two gigabyte 
Right, and the, yeah, and, and actually, the gig, the two gig actually is PyStar, which sits on top of MMDVM, which sits on top of so on. But underneath that is a standard Raspberry Pi Linux operating system. So, um, Andy in the UK takes the standard release from the Raspberry Pi.org Foundation, and he takes that, and then he puts his MMDVM build on top he builds mmdv and puts that on there and then he builds his pi star and puts that on top of there rewraps it as a new pi star image sd card which you download from pi star uk put it on your sd card and you're up and running and still fits well in a two gig um, file size so if you had to guess how many people have, have worked on this to make this all possible um just contributing contributing engineering stuff um there's probably been maybe 10 people who have done a mountain of work um and then there's probably a couple hundred additional people who have done bug fixes and and other new feature ads and things like that I mean, it's a huge number. At its peak, the Yahoo group had, I think it was over 3,000 active members. Now, after Yahoo shut it down, we've lost most of those, but um, it's a huge number. And, and, I, and virtually all of these people who've done these contributions have done them in their spare time, and they're all been contributed into open source. So every, pretty much everything that everybody has done is available for others to use. Sorry, I'm just reading questions here um, as well. Uh, so you can buy a USB antenna RF module to plug into a Raspberry Pi to make it and make it ST usable and plug that in and run it on multiple platforms with the MMDVM software and then use your HT. Oh, let me have another one here. Looks more like this. And you just you plug this into your computer and you can use a Mac, Linux, use um, Windows. Um, and then yes, you can use your HT directly to this and you're off to the races on DSTAR, DMR, Fusion, V25, NXDN. Um, there were other things that I didn't talk about today, like associated projects like BlueDV and um, Peanut and things like that that have also sprung up as part of this whole, huge great world of mmdvm i have uh, another question yeah so uh i i have the um the usb uh, uh version that i i won and uh i had some problems with blue dv it it wasn't playing ball on on my pc and i contacted uh the, you you know the name I I don't remember offhand David David yeah and uh, he said he was not interested in creating a a Mac version for that so my question is is there anything else uh, for the for uh, to use with that other than Blue DV either for Mac or PC are are there any other apps that will recognize uh, your device? Or, um, so or... there's a couple There's a couple things you can do. Um, there was Buster, which is a Mac only app. I've never used it. I don't know much about it. It's on the, it's on the Apple Mac, the, the app, the, the Mac app store. I don't know anything about it, um, but you can run MMDVM host on the Mac. You can, if you, what, what I suggest to people, I, you know, at some point, if I ever had spare time, I would document this, but basically inside of PyStar, if you have PyStar up and running and you're running a, a Zoom Spot USB on, on the PyStar, you can save a backup of your configuration. And in that zip file is basically the mmdvm.ini file. If you, if you get something working on PyStar, you've got 99% of the settings that you need for mmdvm in that file. And then you can download from GitHub the MMDVM source code, and there's a Mac OS 
make file in there where you can build MMDVM for the Mac and run it as a command line with that saved INI file that you get from Pystar. And you can do pretty much everything. It's all command line based, but you can still do everything that you do under, under Pystar because it's still the same MMDVM host underneath. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not so much a code guy, so yeah, I, I know I, I don't I, have, I don't have a great answer for you. Again, if um, I had petitioned to have a version of MMDVM host written with a Qt interface to it, okay, and then that would have meant a simple version that would compile for Mac OS or Linux and would give you a user interface that most people could handle and it would be available in a binary form. But I didn't get any volunteers who were interested enough to help do that. It's so not there's, there's there's nothing HTML wise that you can that would recognize that and and actually be able to interface it just on a on a web page. You could you could take all of all of Andy's Pystar code and port it over to a, a web server on on the Mac. It's just a huge amount of effort. Nobody's ever done it. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm I'm not. I, I have PCs and, and I I have a little netbook. So I mean, I don't need the Mac program necessarily. But I was just having, you know. It, it, it just didn't seem reliable to blue DV on either my PC desktop or on my little netbook. And I, I kind of gave up on it, hoping, 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 hoping that somebody would come up with uh, a, another option other than blue DV to use your, your uh, USB spot. Yeah. Um, I wish I had a better answer that, the difficulty we have is that the install base of Max is so small relative to Windows, relative oh, yeah. to I, Pi, I get, Raspberry yeah. Pis, and it, it, it's hours in the day, and, and really it's motivation. If we had a Mac, someone in the core developers who are really huge fans of a Mac, we'd probably have it. Um, um, well, again, I, I'd, I'd settle for a, another option for the PC other than Blue DV, so it wouldn't have to be for the Mac. Yeah, so we did build a set of files, and there is a set of binaries floating around. I think it's on the ZoomSpot uh, Facebook group that you can just unzip and run from the command line for Windows, but we've never done a set of executables for the Mac, I guess work on that it just hasn't been a priority and all right well i'll look into this buster thing you said it it might be on the uh, apple uh yeah i don't know much about it i just remember hearing that there was a buster thing for for doing some kind of d star related stuff um on the mac um, okay well i'll look into it maybe that's that becomes uh, an option um to be able to to use Yep. Okay. And then there, I do see a question about PyStar Web is primarily PHP. Yes. Um, I, one time I did try to port it over to another, uh, to actually try to put a PHP server on my Windows machine and tried to port it over the code and it didn't go well because it still has to um, work in conjunction with parsing log files and other things that are part of PyStar to get the information it needs to populate things like the last herds. <laughs> 